Jasmine, Ben, Rohan, Nathan, Grace, Maya. And then I'll just take your lap, is that okay? Uh, Shireen, Here. Chandler, Here. Christy, Christy, Here. Sky, Here. Brandon, Here. Ayush, Here. Abhishek, Here. Aditya, Here. Raul, Here. Jatin, Here. Hamza, Tyree, Tyree. Okay, real quick. From Jason's lab, did Aaron show up? From Jason's lab, did Michael, are you Aaron? No. Did Michael Schwartz show up? What about Alexandria Williams? You're here? Did Alexandria say she was here? You guys need to speak loudly. And it looks like a lot of my lab just showed up. Me here, I saw you walk in. Uman, you're here. Chris, you're here. Richard, Julian, y'all please be quiet. From Ed's lab, did Assad show up? You guys, okay, Trayvon. Do we have Muhammad? Hi. Do we have Joseph? Yeah. What about Arjun? Winter? Yeah. Rohan? Yeah. Okay. Is there any way you can call the dorm about like two minutes? Could you call the dorm about two right now. 
and we should do something about it without explaining what we should do about it or how we can combat that problem in the first place. And then we the affirmative also presents impacts to these advantages. So they tell us why those, ad why those advantages matter. What is important about those advantages and what do we prevent from occurring by doing the plan. And this comes in the form of the impacts to the advantages. And we have some examples here, so I have some cool pictures. First is some 1ACs might have a warming advantage. Some might have a nuclear war advantage or a nuclear war impact to an advantage. Some maybe economic collapse, and the list can go on because all of the different advantages might have two to three impacts, maybe different combinations of them. Maybe they'll have one warming impact with lots of different impacts to that warming impact. And then maybe they have a second advantage or a third advantage, which can also do all of those things. So the 1AC wants to have a diversity of impacts so that you can use them and weigh them against the negative strategy. So now we'll, bring, we'll come to the 2AC. The 2AC is an incredibly important speech. Does anyone have any idea why the 2AC is so important? Max? It sets, the structure for the rest of the it sets a important structure for the rest of the debate. So the affirmative is responding to negative positions that were presented in the 1 and C, and the 2AC can choose to deploy certain strategies against negative arguments. So it sort of sets the tone for the debate, what the debate will be about. It can, it's the first time when a lot of clash and argumentation is beginning. Can we think about other reasons why the 2AC may be important? Defending the affirmative Perfect. You also, it's the 2A's time to win back their case, to win back why their affirmative is good. And we're going to use that metaphor of the house in a second. Let's think about other reasons why the 2AC might be important. Um, it sets up all the arguments of the Yes. So when it comes to off-case positions, the negative will present maybe some counterplans or disads or some criticisms, all of the arguments Jason talked about yesterday, and the affirmative then will respond to those. But in addition, the negative in the 1 and C will try to break down your case, will try to pr press against the case. And the 2AC needs to win back that case. So not only do they need to be responding to arguments but they, that the negative has presented for the first time ever, but the affirmative also needs to take what has been presented in the 1AC and then use that evidence to answer case arguments that have been presented in the 1NC. So for instance, maybe we have our Cuba app that we're reading right now. The, in the 1AC, we read our relations advantage and our human rights advantage. It's wise for the 1NC to read responses to the relations advantage and the human rights advantage in the form of impact events. Maybe the 1AC has a hegemony impact. The 1NC is likely to say, hegemony doesn't cause war. The 2AC has to then respond to that by explaining the warrants in their evidence that was presented in the 1AC and using those warrants to explain why hegemony causes war. So the 2AC needs to have a very in-depth knowledge of what the warrants in their cards are in the 1AC. Does that make sense to you all? So here, the second affirmative constructive is the time to win back your arguments, your case arguments, and begin to respond to off-case positions. It's also an essential time that you not only deploy defensive arguments against the 1NC disads, which I'll explain more deeply in a second, but you also want to make sure that you have a counterattack strategy. So when the negative in the 1 and C reacts to the 1 AC by saying, sure, your affirmative sounds like it could be a good idea, however, your affirmative spends a lot of money. When we spend a lot of money, that causes the economy to collapse. If the economy were to collapse, it would cause global nuclear war. That is the form of a disad that we've been talking about a lot in lectures. So it takes the form of a uniqueness, link, internal link, impact argument. Well, the affirmative then can respond and say, actually, no, we save money. We prevent the disad that you have articulated as an advantage for us. And that is the form of an offensive argument. And we'll talk about different forms of offensive arguments in a second more in depth. 
You also, in the 2AC, you don't want to just stand up to give a 2AC with no idea of what the negative might want to go for or what the negative's favorite argument is. So, yesterday, Jason spoke heavily about how when you're preparing on the negative, you don't want to start with the 1 and C. You want to start from the 2 and R and decide what your favorite argument is and then work backward and construct the debate from there. So say I have a really good disad and some really good case arguments that I want to go for in the 2 and R. Well, that's not the only thing I'm going to say in the 1 and C. I'm obviously going to put additional arguments in there to take up time. As a 2A, it's your job to sort of recognize where the debate might be headed in the future. So you want to come up and develop a form of time allocation for the 2AC where you spend more time on arguments that you think will develop further later so that you have a more diversity of arguments against those positions. However, that is not to say that you should not respond to arguments that you don't think the 1NC likes or understands. Because it's the 2A's job to respond to everything, but it's a question of how much you respond to something given how much you think the negative wants to actually extend that argument. So it's a balance. And having that sense and keeping that sense in mind when standing up to give the 2AC is incredibly important. And this is just a continuation of what I just said. So if an argument is bad, do not spend an incredible amount of time on it. Instead, you should talk to the 1A who will be cross-examining the 1 and C and say, you want to know what? I think this disad here, it makes no sense for reasons X, Y, and Z. You should cross-examine on those issues. So then the 1A will stand up for cross-examination of the 1 and C and maybe begin to develop these arguments that, you know, there's really no internal link to this disad. There's really no link to this disad. That means the 2AC can then use those arguments made in cross-X like Melissa said in her lecture, that we want to incorporate the arguments made in cross-examination into our speeches, and then you can spend even less time on that position because you've already destroyed it in cross-examination. So here I have a picture of a very nice mansion. This is your 1AC affirmative house. You've constructed it beautifully. You have some really nice advantages. You have great solvency evidence. You have some really cool impacts to your advantages as well. Well, the 1 and C comes in with a bulldozer. They're trying to rip it down. They have their case arguments to take apart the entirety of your house, and then they raise it, raise you by also presenting reasons why you caused something bad to happen or that you're, the way that you've approached the problem is not necessarily the right way, and they're trying to crush you. The 2AC is a time to not only rebuild your house, but also re-raise in the same way by creating offense on different off-case positions. So in this case, not only do we get a new mansion house that's beautiful, but now it's on the beach, which is even better for us because now we get to go swimming. So there's a sense here that the 2A needs to not only rebuild, but they need to rebuild in a way that is strategic and better for the affirmative team. Does that make sense? Perfect. So now we're going to talk about how to construct two ACs in a way that have a coherent set of arguments that come together to make a strategic package. So when you're affirmative, you have a toolbox. And that toolbox has a variety of arguments that you can make against any given argument. There are so many different arguments you can make against a disad. It's almost endless. But you can't just say everything. Why can't you just say everything? Time. You're limited by time. You don't know what to do. You can't make every single argument in a debate. You have to strategically choose where to spend your time. That means you also have to strategically choose which arguments are best. So in our toolbox to respond to a disad, can someone give me arguments that are available to us? What is in this toolbox? What are some possible responses to a disad? Yeah. So no impact is one of them. Can we think of another one? No link. No link's another one. Yep. Conceding the point. You could, you could concede the disad. I don't think that would be wise to do because then you would be conceding that you caused something bad to happen. But it is a theoretical possibility. I appreciate your bravery. What else do 
do we have? So we have no link, no impact. Yes. We could also impact turn. What are some other options? You could also straight turn in a way, which we're going to talk about. Non-unique. You can also make non-unique. There's one more argument, I'm th two more arguments that are I'm thinking of. That's fine if we don't know them. Yeah. A link turn is the other one, and then no internal link with the other one. Now, sometimes debate jargon is really confusing and hard to get used to. It's hard to figure out what this terminology means, but there is some sense to it. There is some way to decipher the way that the language has developed to make sense of it when you're first learning about what these arguments mean. So as you've talked about in your lab, a disset has different components, that being uniqueness, link, internal link, and impact. So let's put this not just in words, but in an example. So if we have a budget disset, we have our uniqueness that no one is spending money right now. The government is being really fiscally responsible. The link argument would be that the affirmative spends money. The internal link argument would be that spending causes economic collapse. And then the impact argument would be economic collapse causes nuclear war. So that comes in the form of uniqueness, link, internal link, and impact. Well, the affirmative's responses are easy to figure out and tag and understand in the tags because they often just put a no in front of each one of those components. So the responses we just talked about, for example, are non-unique, or no uniqueness, no link, no internal link, or no impact. So if you're ever lost for what the names of your responses are or what the cards in the packet are referring to, that is what they were referring to. It's a response to that initial component in the one and C. Now, there are two other forms of arguments that someone mentioned. We have an impact turn and a link turn. And whenever the word turn is used, this is not referring to a defensive argument. It's not a no argument. Instead, it's a reason that you can make the argument the one and C presents an advantage for the affirmative. A reason why doing the affirmative is a good thing. So here in our arsenal, we have this beautiful red circle. And then we have our non-unique arguments, our, our no-link arguments, our link turn arguments, no internal link argument, no impact, and impact turns. And the red denotes that it's different from the other ones, that it can serve a special purpose in the 2AC, that it is an offensive argument. And here, we can choose, pick and choose which of these arguments we like the most and which strategy as a 2A we think is best used to respond to a dissat. So we have one situation here. And we have all of the similar arguments, once again, in our arsenal to choose from. Well, as a 2A, I don't necessarily feel threatened by this dissat, this spending dissat that the 1 and C has read. I've heard the spending dissat a gajillion times. I've spent some time thinking about it. I think that we have some good cards that the government's spending a lot of money now. That's probably a really good non-unique argument. And there's a good argument for maybe that the affirmative also spends money, or saves money, rather. So I think that we're going to be OK. I don't think that there's anything different about this dissent that is particularly threatening. So a common response to a dissent in the 2AC will be deploying a non-unique argument. And so in this example, it would be that we're spending money now a no-link argument that the plan doesn't cost money. A link turn argument would be, in fact, the plan saves money. A no internal link argument would be that deficit spending doesn't actually hurt the economy. A no impact argument would be economic collapse doesn't cause war. But there's something tricky here. If we have the combination of the non-unique argument and the link turn, that being, we're spending lots of money now, but the plan saves money. Is that now an offensive argument or a defensive argument? Does that make the dissent an advantage for the affirmative? Does the affirmative do something good? Or is it just the generic response to the dissent? Something good. It's something good now. Because right now, in the status quo, we are spending a lot of money. And that's a bad thing as per what the impact argument says. But the affirmative 
present, prevents us from spending that money. In fact, it saves us some money. So we save the economy now with that combination. So if we save the economy, we want to still agree with the negative that saving the economy is a good thing. So we do not want to make the, no, the impact turn argument, that being economic collapse is good in the 2AC. And I think this will make sense more when we get to the two other examples. So here's your summary of the arguments that you could include in the 2AC. I want all of you guys to write that down, so I'll give you a few seconds. This is the, commonly, the common combination of arguments that affirmatives often use against dissents. And this still allows the negative to maybe not extend this position in the block, but there's no reason why you feel a need to try to force them to extend the dissad. You think you aren't threatened by it in any unique way. Still want me to keep this slide up or no? Yes, okay. Let me know when you're good. <coughs> We're good now? All right, so let's go to example number two. We have the same group of arguments. However, now we kind of, the, uh, the one and C has a really good strategy that they clearly really want to go for. That being they've read the sick new disad that we have no answers to. They also have a counter plan that may solve the F in a very persuasive way that we don't have good cards against either. So as a two-way, that's sometimes a very scary position to be in. To listen to the one and see and say, yikes, we might be in trouble here. Well, thankfully, they also read a generic throwaway budget dissent that it doesn't seem like they actually care that much about, but they put it in their one and see to suck up time. A lot of negative teams will do this. Sometimes they need to have more off-case positions in the 1 and C to fill up the full eight minutes. So they'll put in some random disad or something that is very generic. And because now there is the combination of a disad that seems to be a throwaway disad, which in this instance might be the budget disad, plus a counter plan that solves the app, and the net benefits of that is a disad we have no answers to, it seems like we're in some trouble. As a 2A, you need to change the game. You need to do something to alter the way this debate is going to occur, because if you let it continue unabated, you will most likely lose. And this is an important thing for 2As to understand. You can be as cocky as you want about your evidence. You can think that you have the best affirmative in the world, but there will always be a time when a negative has done a lot of research, and it may catch you off guard. You may be in trouble here. You need to recognize that, and the earlier you can recognize that as an affirmative team, the better. Because then you have the opportunity to enter or play new chess pieces, basically, to do something to change the game, to change what's happening. And if you feel a need to do that, there's something in debate that allows you to do so. That's called a straight turn. And I think that, Arash, you have mentioned this, right? So a straight turn is when you do not present any arguments in the 2AC that the negative could concede to get out of the disad. Instead, you just want to straight up make the disad an advantage for the affirmative. So just like we talked about about two minutes ago, how you can extend an, you can read a non-unique argument that spending is occurring now, and you can read a link turn argument that the plan saves money, that combination of arguments is now a straight up advantage for the affirmative. And that's all you say. You don't say anything else. Those two arguments in themselves turn the disad from being something that the affirmative does badly, but rather now the affirmative doing this is a good thing. It becomes an advantage for the affirmative. It is no longer a disadvantage. And this is an important tool in your toolbox if you think that the negative may have another strategy that they want to extend in the block. Now, if this is an advantage for the affirmative, why might this mess up block time allocation? Why might this make the negative have to rechange the way they thought the debate was going to happen? Does anyone have any ideas? They're forced to cover it. 
They're forced to respond to this argument. One thing that two A's need to realize is that two ends have their little arguments that they love. They really love this disad that they spend a lot of time writing. Maybe they really like this counterplan that they think has some great solvency evidence. And often before the debate, they have a plan of what they want to do. They start from the 2 and R with the arguments they like, and then they work backward. And if the affirmative can throw a wrench in that plan and say, no, your block division is not going to be this sick counterplan and disad that I have no answers to, instead I'm going to force you to also respond to this disad that you put in because you thought that it was going to waste my time, now the 2A has changed strategy. It is change the game in a way that forces the negative to respond to this argument no matter what. And they have presented the impact to this argument. So they can't say, no, wait, economic collapse doesn't cause war. That's not the situation. Instead, they have presented the impact to this argument. You agree that impact is a big deal, but you don't think you cause it. You think you prevent it. So it's a very strategic way that the affirmative can sort of change the calculus. Yes? But what about the other issue? So you would still need to respond to the other dissent. This doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to win this debate. However, it does give you some time to, or it means the block will spend less time on that position. So maybe they won't cover your arguments as well, or maybe they won't have as much time to extend it, or maybe they just won't even extend it anyway because they don't think that they can extend that other really good dissent with the limited amounts of time they have now. So it's not a, a silver bullet. It's not going to win you the debate always. However, it is a way that you can make the, the 2NC have to spend time places where they didn't want to. And often this frazzles 2Ns because they're so obsessed with that one argument they really want. And if you straight turn something, then they have to sit there during prep time. They have to think about how they're going to rearrange their block to fit time for all these arguments. And that just gives you an advantage. It puts them on their feet, sort of switches the side of who's running the debate. But you still want to read responses to the other dissent. So we'll get to our third and final example. We have all of these arguments as well. Same, same in our arsenal. However, this time we just want to, we also want to do a similar strategy as the number two that we talked about. However, we don't want a link turn. We want an impact turn. Someone said impact turn over here, correct? Yes. So we want an impact turn. We want to say, the plan doesn't cause something bad to happen. The thing that we cause to happen, that being economic collapse, is actually a really, really good thing. Because economic growth is really hurting the environment, and if we were able to dismantle the economy, we would prevent global warming from occurring. And this is now what we call an impact turn strategy. So here we would just read our impact turns that growth hurts the environment, causes global warming, and we would also read no impact evidence against economic collapse. That being, if economic collapse were to occur, it wouldn't lead to nuclear war. Because you do not want to grant the negative their impact claim if you're impact turning. You want to say that their impact is not that big of a deal, and degrowth would be OK and prevent global warming from occurring. Summary right there for you. And this serves the same purpose as our second example. You can change the game. So back to your question, if you really want to get a little bit funky and you think you're in trouble on this new disad that they've read, maybe you could impact turn that disad if you're really in trouble. And the reason a lot of people like impact turns is because there are a wide variety of impacts that people can read, but in reality, that list is somewhat small. A lot of people read econ impacts, a lot of people read warming impacts, a lot of people read hegemony impacts, and a lot of teams have impact turn files to those arguments already prepared. So if you have nothing left to say, some teams will just decide to impact turn. So the rules of this game that I have just presented to you when approaching how to respond to a 2AC, uh, in the, or a dissent in the 2AC is beware. You don't want to make the two red arguments, the two offensive arguments, in combination. And I think that's e the red arguments are visibly salient to you, so you'll remember them. They're the two arguments that have the turns on them. So you don't want to make a link turn argument that you save money. Saving money would make sure the economy stays, stays sustained, 
you save the economy from collapsing. You don't want to say that and that we need to collapse the economy. If you say you save the economy, but we need to collapse the economy, now you what we call double turned yourself. Because you say you prevented something from happening that actually needs to happen. And negatives love when affirmatives mess this up. Because they've just read a diss out against themselves. And it's very, very difficult for the affirmative to come back from this. So this leads me to point out, when you're going up to give a 2 AC, do not randomly throw cards together and say, I'm going to read these. It requires thinking time before the debate. What do I want to say against the budget to set? What would I want to say against the politics to set? And you want to put those cards in a certain order in a certain combination that works for you, and not double turn yourself. So here, the second point is just saying, though, if you want to force the negative to respond to the argument, then you want to go with your link turn or your impact turn strategies, which was number two and number three. However, if it's not a uniquely threatening position, it's totally fine to just go with number one. And I can tell you that in almost all of the two ACs I gave last year, I very rarely felt a need to just straight turn out of the two AC. So it's not always a common thing to do. However, it's a last resort option if you feel like you need to change the game. So the last part here is just saying, you need to sit down before the tournament. You need to figure out what all of the possible arguments are against the certain position, you need to make a list of the certain positions that are out there, and then you need to pick and choose which arguments from your arsenal are best to be deployed against the different variety of dissets or counterpoints that can be read. That's the, the answering dissets component. Are there any questions about that? I'm going to send the PowerPoint to your lab leaders, and they can definitely re-go over the double turn, because the double turn can be confusing. Mm -hmm. Can you re-explain the point about um, impact time you said no impact and impact time you have to be seen? Exactly, I'll re-explain that. So, for example, another way that teams might do this, maybe they just add as a warming impact, and it says warming causes extinction. An impact turn to this argument might be, actually, increased CO2 in the air is a good thing because it allows plants to grow and because they take in CO2. If more plants grow, we'll have more food, and that prevents food scarcity. If there's food scarcity, there will be food wars that result in nuclear war. That could be uh, the impact turn argument. However, if you grant the negative that warming will cause extinction, then they still get to weigh their initial warming impact versus your food prices nuclear war impact turn. So, when you are deploying an impact turn strategy, you also want to make sure that you respond to the initial impact. Because when it comes to impact calculus, calculus which Stephen will be talking about on Monday, you want to make sure that you beat back the original impact and also have your impact turn. And they can't concede that, they could theoretically be like, you're right, warming doesn't cause extinction. But that doesn't help them. Because you've still read an argument that warming itself, though, will help prevent food wars. So then they would just have no impact to weigh against yours. So you just want to, if you're impact turning ever on the negative or on the affirmative, you want to respond to the initial impact. Now we have some, I'm going to put these up here, and you guys can type them up, because I always feel like when I was learning about debate, I wish I had a list of all of the arguments that were in my arsenal to respond to some things. And that being, I thought that it was sometimes really confusing to figure out how to respond to counterplans. Well, here is a list of six arguments that are within your arsenal. And I've already given these arguments to my lab. So you can type them up. I'm briefly going to talk quickly through them. But you should uh, use them when writing up blocks of counterplans. The first argument is intuitive. The negative presents a counterplan that says, we solve your advantage. The affirmative wants to reply, no, you do not solve the advantage. Often, people forget this. They don't remember to say, no, the counterplan doesn't solve. Second, 
is you could read an argument that the counter plan also causes the net benefit to occur. Third, you can read a disadd to the counter plan. So maybe the counter plan is to increase the size of the army to solve hegemony. You could read a disadd to that and say, increasing the size of the army would provoke our adversaries and would make them really angry. That would collapse hegemony, something like that. Fourth, is you can make arguments regarding the, the dispositionality of the counter plan, and we'll talk about this next week, but this has to do with how the negative is choosing to run their counter plan. They could either just get rid of it at any point in the debate, or they have to read it no matter what. The last two is you can make theory arguments about the type of counter plan. So maybe the plan is the president should do something. The negative can read a counter plan that the the Congress should do something. And that's what we call an agent counterplan. So you also have the possibility to read theory against the type of counterplan that has presented. And then the last argument are permutations, which I'm sure you'll talk about more in depth with your lab. But for right now, I just wanted you to have a list of the different types of arguments that can be made against counterplans. I still hear typing, so I'll let you finish that up, and then we're going to move on. And I can also just email this or put it on my lab. I'll put it on my lab's wiki, and you can take a look at the PowerPoint. Are we okay? Okay. So the 1AR. The 1AR is a special speech because it's quite difficult. The 1AR is hard because you have to respond to two speeches of arguments, the 2NC and the 1NR. And you only have five minutes to do that. Well, the way to give a great 1AR is to pick and choose which arguments you think are absolutely necessary to win near, you the debate, and then add maybe one or two arguments in addition to that to force the 2NR to respond to them, but you have your game plan for the 2AR. Second is you want to make sure that you say enough arguments to let the 2AR also pick and choose and narrow further. So this is not the, the ultimate time to narrow, but rather beginning to think about how you want to narrow and then also leaving some more options for making the debate even smaller later. And 1ARs often for really important arguments might write out blocks for that. So I have an example up here. So the 2AC will make, do the strategy number one we talked about. The no impact, no link, link turn, no internal link, and no impact. Before the 1AR, me and my partner decide that the block has read so many non or uniqueness cards in the block, we are not going to win that argument. We do not have time in the 1AR to invest a bunch of time reading cards to respond to the seven cards they read in the block. But they did not handle our no link argument well or our no internal link or no impact argument. So we're going to go with those. So in the 1AR, we extend our no link argument in the f this fashion. We say our no link. We explain the warrants from our 2AC cards. We explain why our evidence is better. Maybe we read some cards there. And then we do that for all of these other arguments as well. But here we've decided to abandon some of the original 2AC arguments because you are not obligated to extend all of them. But then the 2AR, they really, really like the no internal link argument. The no internal link argument is going to win you the debate, and you know that. You know that no internal link argument is going to win you the debate. So in the 2AR, you can choose to no longer extend the no link argument, no longer extend the no impact argument, and instead blow up the no internal link argument to be even bigger and explain why it wins you the debate. But the 2NR still needs to respond to your no link argument and your no impact argument. And why is this strategic? Why does this help the 2AR then if they have the possibility of doing this? They can choose whichever one they make. Exactly. You have the you have hindsight. You know what they've said to your arguments. You know all the possibility response to it. The 2AR gets to speak last. So here, you have a huge time trade-off. The 2NR has to spend time responding to all three of these arguments. You get to spend all of that time only extending one. Wait, even if you drop them in the 1AR, they have to answer them in the 2NR? Not, not the non-unique or linked turn arguments. Those are done. OK. But the 2NR will need to respond to no link, no internal link, and no impact.
But the two AR can then respond, choose not to extend no length or no impact and just extend an internal length. Good question. So text you're giving a good t one AR is you want to extend theory, because theory is another thing like an offensive argument on the dissat or a straight turn. They have to respond to it. Second is maybe you want to extend an add-on that you read in the 2AC, and an add-on is another advantage to the app. It's just mini, a bit smaller, maybe two to three cards. One, the best 1ARs during the block, they circle important arguments, and they know that they have to respond to them. So the more and more you debate, you get a sense of which arguments are most important and which ones must be responded to. So the 1AR wants to circle them, highlight them, star them, do whatever you need to do to ensure that you respond to the argument. Otherwise, you may drop it because the 1AR is fast, it's quick, you're saying a lot of arguments, you're trying to read a lot of cards, it's easy to let things slip through the cracks. So you need to make sure that you have some mechanism to make sure that you respond to all of the arguments. Also, the 1AR has the possibility to just kick out of an advantage. So say you read a hegemony advantage and a warming advantage. There's some really, really, really good arguments for why hegemony doesn't cause war, and you're just getting your butt kicked on this. You do not want to keep answering this argument because you really don't know how to answer it, and you really don't have the cards to answer it. You can concede that hegemony doesn't cause war. That nullifies the argument. It's no longer relevant but just explain your warming arguments and win back that because that will save you a good chunk of time. And it's important, oh, now we've gotten to the 2AR. There are a couple of things here that we want to mention. First is the 2AR has the beauty of hindsight. Last time you have to speak, no one's saying arguments after you. You get to sit down for the 2AR during prep time and figure out how you're going to win this debate. You get the last opportunity to speak, and no one's going to say anything after you. So it's to your advantage to do some thinking time before the 2AR and figure out how you're going to win. So some ways that you can do this, and these are two tricky options that affirmatives often think about when crafting impacts for their arguments, is impact calculus is really important in the 2AR. So there are two ways that you can leverage the affirmative in the 2AR that often win you the debate. The first being, if you have some reason why the affirmative advantage solves the disadvantage's impact, that's a good argument to spend a lot of time talking about. So some examples like this that are really good impacts for debate are hegemony. A lot of hegemony impacts could claim to maybe resolve India-Pakistan war. They could claim to solve China war. They could claim to solve Russia war. And these are reasons why the affirmative should read hegemony impacts because then, that impact is not unique to the negative. The affirmative also controls that impact. The second way that you can make the affirmative especially strategic is saying that the negative's impact, being China war or Russia war, is inevitable in a world where we don't have hegemony. So that impact is also no longer unique to the, to the negative. That's going to happen no matter what. The only way that we can solve it is through the plan. And some people refer to this as a try or die argument. It's something really bad is going to happen now no matter what. The plan is the only way to resolve that, or the only attempt to resolve that. Therefore, you should vote affirmative. And this is a commonly, commonly used strategy. The 2AR also has the opportunity to pick their best arguments. We've already talked about this with our last example. You have to explain why the argument that you have chosen is important, why it matters, and why it wins you the debate. It's also important not to just reiterate arguments. The 2AR, you have as much time as you want to spend three minutes talking about your no internal link argument. That was actually maybe only 20 seconds of the 2AC. Maybe it was only 10 seconds of the 1AR. But now you have a grand three minutes to talk about this argument. And 2ARs often do this, two ends, think this is cheating, two ARs think that you're allowed to do this, and you should do it. If the argument was in the one AR, you can sit on it in the two AR and explain why it went through the debate. And also, don't feel like you have to be super fast. When you're first learning to give two ARs, it's better to understand why you've chosen the arguments that you have, explain that to the judge, and explain why that wins you the debate. 
Don't feel pressure to be super speedy at this point. Rather, understand why the combination of arguments you've chosen is especially good. So now that we've gotten through the hard part of it. The rest of this is really easy. So how to prepare. First is you want to write blocks. I've referred to this already. Blocks are pre-written answers to arguments, basically. And they're ways that you can either extend arguments or that you can use to respond to arguments. So here's an example. Maybe you want to answer the oil decide. Here is a block, a 2AC block, that would respond to this argument. And it's not important for you to understand the content of this because it's not applicable. It was from the high school topic last year. But if we notice here, the blocks have interspersed analytic arguments that have bold, flowable tags. So it says impact inevitable. It says no internal link. It has a warrant for that. They are not just a, like four in analytic arguments and then a card. The analytic arguments are interspersed between cards. The cards are highlighted and ready to be read. Also, this 2AC block was probably already practiced. It was already read. I would have a sense for how long it would take me. Also, there are 1AR blocks here. It already has the explanation of the, what, the argument that you're extending. So this might be like when I showed you that example of the 1AR extensions of 1AR narrowing. This might be an example of a block that you already have written for that no link argument or that no internal link argument. And if you have time, you can read that card. Herndon wrote this block for me, actually. But see how this is helpful. It saves you prep time. You put this on your computer, you're ready to extend that argument already. And then you can mend it during the actual debate to be applicable to whatever the other team has said or what other cards they've said to respond to this. So what makes a block good? You have to make sure it's flowable by the judge, by numbering your arguments, by interspersing analytic arguments. You want to include cross-examination points. You don't want to just use the block without changing it, mending it for the debate. You also want to change them to apply to the certain debate. Oh, and that's all. So for the camp tournament, you want to write these blocks. You want to look in the files that are on the wiki. You want to find which cards you like. And you want to make your own blocks. You want to make your own responses. Now, what makes an affirmative a good affirmative? Couple of criteria here. First is you want to have strong solvency evidence. A lot of affirmatives actually don't have this. They don't have good evidence that says they actually do anything. This is an important thing on your checklist. You also want to have different types of advantages with lots of different impacts. We talked about this at the beginning. Some affirmatives like to have some sort of uniqueness trick. Maybe the affirmative is to increase nuclear power for a specific type of reactor. The affirmative would like to use the argument that nuclear power is already coming. People are already investing in nuclear power. Now it's just a question of which reactor type we choose. And this is really good and helpful against a lot of disads because disad links might be just generic to nuclear power spends money. If that's the case, the affirmative is already ahead because nuclear power is happening now. It's just a question of what type of reactor we choose. Finally, well not finally, but almost, how to research. Like I said, you want to make sure that you have good solvency evidence. So you want to poke around on the internet and try to find some good solvency evidence. Something I've always done is Google has a function that you can set up Google Alerts. As a two-way for every affirmative I've ever run, I would have Google Alerts set up for my affirmative mechanism. So last year it was basically carbon capture and storage and stuff about global warming. So I had a Google alert set up that would send me every email or any article that was written that included any of these terms and they were sent to me every single day. So before tournaments I would sift through them and I would be very comfortable with what was evolving in the research with my firm. You also want to scout other teams. Other teams might be reading your affirmative. You want to find out what they're saying, what their new answers are. You can take those answers, cut those cards, you also want to know what other people are saying against your affirmative. And a commonly held research practice is if you're writing an app, you should also try to write the negative to your app so you can know what people are going to say against it. The more you're familiar with the negative evidence, 
the more, as a two-way, you can explain why that negative evidence is irrelevant. I'll go back so you can finish typing that up. And finally are just some small advanced tips. A lot of teams like to write new affirmatives throughout the year. When you break a new affirmative, it's really strategic because the negative doesn't have time to prepare in advance. They don't have that opportunity to have a bunch of well-researched evidence against your affirmative. You can also break new advantages. So often throughout the year, maybe at the final tournament or the first year after a tournament after Christmas break, people might break new, new affirmatives to try to catch the negative off guard. You also should read add-ons in the 2AC. These are many versions of advantages, like I mentioned earlier. This forces the negative to respond to your argument again. So we're seeing a theme here. The more the 2AC can put pressure on the block, the better they're able to read arguments in the 2AC that the negative has to respond to. So that's a great tip. Also, you should try to learn to debate theory because if you ever feel like you're in ultra trouble, theory is sometimes a good option for you. I won like four debates on theory this past year. Debates I probably should have lost on substance. You should also do practice two ACs with your coach or just come up with a possible one and see that someone could read. Then force yourself to read a two AC in even less than eight minutes so that you can narrow down your arguments, figure out what your best arguments are. Also, try to keep up with current events. The more you know, the better you are at debate. The more you can integrate knowledge about what's going on, and you can apply that against certain arguments that are being read against you. You want to spend time thinking about what arguments are best for the 2AR and which arguments are winning 2AR arguments. That way, when it comes time to give the 2AR, you don't need to sit there writing everything out. Rather, you know what you want to say, but you can make sure that what you're saying is specific to what happened in that particular debate. You also don't want someone to hand you 1AC, and then you just highlight it. A good 2A will go back and read the original articles that the 1AC was developed from. So you know the context of those articles, and you know what the 1AC is actually talking about. You also want to learn how to frame debates, which is something that you can talk to your lab leaders about, but this comes down to a lot of impact calculus that Stephen will talk about. And those are the final advanced tips. Are there any questions? No questions right now? Well, I hope that was, oh, yes. Um, can you go back to uh, what makes a good block? Yeah. Do I just like to finish getting it? There you go. But I'll put this PowerPoint up on the Miller Marshall Lab webpage, so if you want to look at it, you can take a look there. I hope that it was helpful, and I hope that it helped you sort of think about how you want to plan when you're affirmative to make sure that you win the debate. So, like five minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Five minutes. Um, before, hold on. Before anybody leaves, we need to make sure.